Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second Monero Meet, where we have a nice casual conversation, catch up on latest news, the like, just like a Monero coffee chat. Uh, you have many faces here from the Monero communities. You have, of course, me, Justin, uh, for reporting from a different backdrop. You have Dr. Daniel Kim. You have Tallest Man. You have Need Money 90, who is, of course, hiding behind uh, a Monero meme, but at least it's a good Monero meme for you to look at for the whole episode. It makes sure that we stay fun the whole time. And then, of course, we have Vic, too, joining us. So right off the bat, I want to make sure to point out the most important change or most important update is that Monero 0.17 is out. The CLI version is out. The GUI is coming soon in tr trademark sense, of course. And uh, that is really important for you to pay attention to because there is an October 17th network protocol upgrade. So you will need to make sure your wallet, node, etc., are all updated before this date for you to continue sending transactions. Uh, Doug, can you talk about like this, one of the big changes that came as a result of, of uh, you know, this 0 0.17 release? Uh, yeah, so we got about a 30% reduction in wallet scanning times. Uh, I believe somebody in the subreddit commented that we went from about 15 minutes for a refresh down to about 11, which I think is a pretty big deal because this uh, covers everything for you know people trying to initially sync their wallet and it's one of the larger uh, support issues that we have to deal with. So it's really nice to know that we're cutting that down to sites. Yeah, it's really, really cool. Um, and, and Vic, you said CakeWallet will be ready for everyone. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And, and upgrades like this are really important for us. I mean, user experience, I'm always trying to improve the user experience. And as Need Money 90 says, if the uh, sync times are 30% lower, that's going to... That's going to be huge for our users, uh, and not just for Cake users, but for any Monero users. So yeah, we'll be ready as, as always. We haven't let we haven't let you down yet. So <laughs> <laughs> can I just say too? I don't think I've ever got to thank you, Vic, and your team for for Cake Wallet. I was one of the first people to download that uh, on iOS oh, when it you. came out, and um, I do encourage. I, I keep a small Monero balance on there, and it's just a real nice thing to get someone else to download the app who I'm speaking to in person and I can give them an error right there on the spot and it all just works pretty seamlessly. Oh, uh, I'm ready to give a five star hear. review on the app store guys. <laughs> like yeah, that comment, that's... subscribe. <laughs> you know what? I'm glad you brought that up because we, we've been talking internally about that, that if you're, if whoever's listening or tallest menu as well, if, if you can give a uh, review on the app store, that would be great because I don't think the rating reflects the feedback we get from the community outside of the app store. So if you can I th take I think a second, right, yeah. yeah, I think if you can take a second and give a little comment, give us five stars or four stars, what do you think we deserve? That would be great. Sorry. I didn't mean to hijack your, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no five star right. review incoming. Thank you. Monero so meet sponsored by cake wallet. Yeah. It's not, <laughs> not <actually. really. laughs> it's not actually. It just threw anyone out there. <laughs> oh, um, speaking I've of tried. Kick, actually. <laughs> you have tried Vic, by the way. You have tried to sponsor these, and we've said no. Uh, um, speaking of Kick, like by the way, uh, we on uh, r slash Monero have recently added some filters with the help of Vic, um, where. If, if you guys hadn't noticed, uh, over the past couple weeks, we've had very large influxes of posts about Cake Wallet and, hey, my coins haven't arrived, or how do I do this, or all sorts of questions. And uh, this subreddit's really intended to be a place for discussion of the protocol and not for support. So uh, it was really nice that we actually managed to i mean vic helped us write a blurb that now appears when people mention cake wallet and tells them where they can go to get help and everything and that's that's going to be real nice for clearing up some of the clutter on the subreddit so thank thanks for the help that was great i know i think it's a good move i mean even i was starting to see every other post was about cake or you know converting bitcoin to monero and cake and it was just i'm glad somebody spoke up and i'm glad you reached out and I'm glad we came up with a good solution for it. Um, so even even for the Cake Wallet subreddit, we have a new subreddit now, uh, which we haven't officially launched yet, but it's there. So it's Cake underscore Wallet, rather than the old Cake Wallet IO. We're trying to get away from that. So I, mean, I hope Diego helps us out on building that subreddit out, making it look pretty and functional. 
I've actually reached out to him as per Need Money '90s recommendation. So yeah, so I think I think the R slash Monero will be more clean now with all the cake stuff out of there. It's and, and actually one day I wanted to post, hey, R slash Monero is not a cake support forum. <laughs> 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 but I, before doing that, I'm glad we came up with a, a good solution. Yeah, it's it's working good. really well. People when when I see things caught in the queue, they're generally posting in the right places now, which is nice. Cool. It's, good. it's always good that people get help where they where they need it because we want to have a high quality support, but also at the same time we don't want Arm and Arrow to just be a, a full support thread because then it's not exactly. useful to the vast majority of people that don't actually need support in that case. Um, yeah, Dr. Kim, you, do you want to talk a little bit more about what the O.17 network upgrade means uh, to people and what they need to do? Yeah, sure. So it is a hard fork, which means that it's not backwards compatible with the previous versions of the software. And the reason that is, is that there's a new innovation that's been baked into 0.17, which is CL SAGs. Uh, and so CL SAGs enable a uh, more efficient processing of the data that goes into the um, blockchain that uh, is a record of who sent what to whom. And so this is a um, uh, example of an innovation that uh, is going into Monero that improves the way that the engine works under the hood, which is a rare thing to see in cryptocurrencies. And so it's a um, not only is it a large step forward, but it's one that was, uh, again, as usual mm -hmm. in Monero, it was a large step forward that was done with a, a large degree of caution and uh, testing. So there was a audit process for the um, new research that went into CL SAGs that preceded this moment. And uh, I'm glad to say that my uh, consulting firm, Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, was uh, one of the participants in the funding of that audit, um, with about 20% uh, of the audit being paid for. So yeah, it's uh, great to see this uh, long pipeline of innovation finally um, resulting in this, uh, just the latest example of a, a technological innovation at Monero that improves the product. Yeah, CLSEGs are a huge step forward. And the, the good news, I think, is that it's, even though it is a huge step forward, it really just represents one step in the, you know, huge repertoire of things that Monero can move towards in the future. It, it's it's an incredibly exciting achievement that we're already implementing. And there are even more exciting ones going forward. And so sometimes it's easy to be, you know, dismissive of the, the major achievements that we've already achieved when there are big ones that we're looking forward to. But honestly, like this is, already a substantial reduction in transaction size and, verifi and, and verification time. It's, it's really awesome work from an Air Research Lab. Super cool. And uh, uh, now yeah, even... It, it also underlines the uh, kind of difference in philosophy at Monero versus some other projects which are more um, ossified in the way that they regard new innovations coming in. So the flexibility that Monero has in being not only receptive to hard forks, but actually kind of welcoming of them because they bring new good stuff onto the, onto the uh, protocol is something that allows Monero to be um, receptive to kind of major quantum leaps in, in uh, quality. Yeah, it really does. Very cool stuff. So everyone, big takeaway is if you get nothing else from this episode, update your software you know if you're using cake just make sure you are updating your app in the app store it'll roll through if you're running it you're a monero d update that if you're using the gui cli update that send your transactions it'll be faster it'll be more efficient it'll be great so you know keep going monero great work a bunch of other minor ch changes by comparison to cl sag included uh, they're all listed on the Monero website, so check those out. There's a blog post dated September 17th if you're if you're going through. Um, and, and there were 30 people that worked towards this release, so it's certainly a large number of contributors to this the specific release. In, in addition to everyone who's contributed in the past and contributes in other ways outside of just contributing to the code. So it's you know of course super super awesome. Um, however, I want to turn it over now to Tallest Man because there was a big set of news that came out the, you know within the last week and and. Really, a large amount of Monero discussion in the past month has been related to compliance, has been related to regulation, has been related to certain tracing capabilities. On this channel, for example, we we interviewed the CEO of CypherTrace, who 
put out a, a press release, uh, you know, f- a few weeks ago now. So really, there's been a ton of stuff that have come out in the last month, and I think that we have plenty of time to talk about that here. But can you first talk about, you know, the Perkins Coie white paper and and what that means for people? I know you were a contributor towards it also. Yeah, of course. So interesting, like you said, in the developments um, with the Cipher Trace interview and their claimed tracing abilities of Monero, I. I mean, I think it's well established now by this point, you know, in big part, thanks to that interview, that maybe the capabilities aren't as robust as everybody first thought that they might be. Um, And interesting to note, too, that that I've been in discussions with folks in the Monero community. They're already planning for what happens when those capabilities get a little bit more robust. I think people are already thinking two or three steps ahead in terms of ring size increases uh, and all that sort of thing. So I really don't know what... Um, what the game plan is for these these firms that are are going to try to trace Monero. Um, the only thing I can think of is that by displaying uh, to to corporate people, executives, and whatnot, or, or these you know middle management types at various uh, in various compliance departments of banks and uh, whoever else might be concerned with this sort of thing, if, if they could see a nice graph and some pie charts and different probabilities. I think that's what they want to see. And, and if they can produce something like that, that's not inaccurate about Monero using, um, you know, by tracking outputs or something. I mean, that might serve everybody well. You can't actually trace a transaction, but, you know, maybe maybe also the suits at uh, whatever bank or a compliance department, they're satisfied seeing that as well. So I don't know. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's not. One of the things I wanted to comment on about the Perkins white paper was that I found this paragraph interesting. I will just read it aloud here. FinCEN also made a critical distinction in the 2019 FinCEN guidance between those who provide anonymizing services and those who merely support anonymizing software. Specifically, FinCEN viewed those that provide anonymizing services, e.g. mixers and tumblers, whereby persons accept cryptocurrency and retransmit in such a manner designed to prevent others from tracing the transmission to the source as being regulated money transmitters and thus MSBs. Does anyone have any comment on that? I can think of a number of projects that might potentially be uh, regulated as MSBs per the FinCEN guidance. Yeah, I think, um, a funny thing, I was looking at that exact paragraph this morning, and obviously as a a wallet maker, these regulations affect us or could affect us directly, not now, but I think it really just comes down to if you're taking ownership, you know, those money mixers, you're putting, they're taking ownership of your Bitcoin or crypto or whatever, Monero or whatever. I think that's what it really comes down to, where as a cake wallet is not doing that, right? It's just a, it's just a tool, anonymizing tool to control the blockchain. That's all it is. So it's funny that you brought that up. I was reading the exact same paragraph this morning. So all those Bitsler and Mixler and all those places, yeah, they, they should they should fall under these guidelines. Yeah, yeah my interpretation, Thomas, man, is that in general, in order to be considered an MSB, typically you need to have some type of custody or otherwise can control some type of, you know, some overt control over the network. Cake wallet really doesn't fit either of those categories. So, for, for example. Yeah, I would definitely agree. I mean, obviously, I don't know how Cake Wallet works behind the scenes, but I think that, uh, you know, anything with an active mixing is going to need to be uh, kind of aware of these regulations or at least pay a little more attention than maybe they have been. Another thing that I will point out is that uh, there was a blog post put up recently, or maybe it wasn't a blog post, but it was a comment from the Monero Outreach community uh, on you know, a website with the word coin in a name. And it was basically encouraging the IRS to try to understand Monero. Maybe the 600, whatever it was, $625,000 they want to spend to break Monero would be better spend hiring a consultant or two for a period of time to teach them how Monero works. Um, Because I think even that address that they had posted as a blacklist, does that determine that it was a testnet address or was it just a, a view key or something? Yeah, just to, to set some additional context here, OFAC, so this, this was not the IRS, but OFAC, okay. which is the Office of Foreign Assets Control, 
they put out um, related to a specific individual several addresses addresses um, which included a Monero address which actually was a Monero payment ID so it's an arbitrary string the way it basically worked is it probably went to an exchange for this user said what are all the deposit addresses for this user for Monero it used to be the case that exchanges used the same address for every user and said, just include this payment ID when you send a transaction. So they probably put this payment ID as in the OFAC list because that was the way that the exchange identified the user. So we're we're instead of history, but yeah, they, um, that, that's the context for what we were talking about there. Well, either way, I would like to formally, if the IRS is listening, you give me $600,000, I will do it for cheaper and I will come and educate you guys for a period of time and I will give half of the money back to the Monero dev community. The other half, I'm not going to lie, I'll probably go to Miami and rent a yacht or something. So you're giving them a $25,000 discount. Exactly. <laughs> huge, huge discount. <laughs> COVID-19, it's tough times for everybody. Hey, could I go well, back to, could I go back to uh, your paragraph that you mentioned? If you don't mind. If you read the next paragraph... I think it's also important to the Monero developers. The next paragraph basically says that if you're just making software to anonymize, then you don't fall under these regulations. So, you know, that's something that always comes up, like, you know, people developing code and hiding and being anonymous. You're not in trouble. If you're making code for Monero, you're free and clear. And the document states that very clearly. So uh, just wanted to get that out there as well. The next paragraph is also very interesting. I don't know if Dr. Kim has any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think generally it, it, it is one of the counterintuitive things about Monero is that uh, people might be surprised to hear that uh, among the proponents of Monero are people who are the most concerned about regulatory compliance. And so um, as a result of the um, of Bitcoin coming out, you know, this that, that was the source of the original guidance from FinCEN. Uh, regarding who is to be regulated as a money service provider. And so they take exception to Bitcoin. I mean, or they make an exception for Bitcoin, uh, pointing out that the rewards in Bitcoin go to a decentralized group of computers that is worldwide and, and uh, spread out. And so because of that, there is no centralized group of people who can be kind of pointed at and uh, given the responsibility of you know, uh, additional compliance requirements for KYC AML. And so there's a, you know, a large number of people who I talk with in the Monero community for whom that's actually important, that, that this was actually a motivating factor in their deciding to get behind Monero in that it is decentralized. There is no uh, group of, you know, master nodes or a group of, um, you know, there are all sorts of euphemisms for, uh, special groups of people who get money in cryptocurrency. Um, but, you know, whether you call it a, you know, a dev reward or a, you know, founders, you know, bonus or whatever, like all these different names, which in the end come down to a, a centralized group of people getting some of the money basically from the system. Uh, Monero has none of that. And so it remains decentralized and, uh, you know, the compliance is actually easier. It's actually less of a headache because you don't have these centralized groups who can be accused of, for example, uh, having issued a security. So that, that gets them in trouble with uh, SEC jurisdiction or being accused of uh, money laundering. Uh, that gets them in, in uh, the crosshairs of FinCEN and any other number of uh, regulatory agencies for whom uh, who have an interest in, in these problems with, as they grapple with the implications of this new uh, technology that was introduced to the world through Nakamoto consensus. I just want to step in really quickly and say one thing we really take for granted in Monero is that there is not a single sensible person that reasonably believes that Monero is a security, right? For many cryptocurrencies, the main compliance conversation is around whether or not something is a security, right? Whether or not SEC jurisdiction applies. In relation to Monero, it is so obviously not a security that we haven't had to be bogged down in those specific conversations. So, you know, you talk about any Ethereum, really ERC-20 token in general, 
the conversations about whether something's a security or not are just completely endless, right? Like there's a go on and on and on. And I think that we're able, we really take for granted that we don't need to deal with any of that crap, right? We like, we know it's not a security. It's not just a, an opinion within the Monero community. There's a crypto ratings council that gave Monero the least possible score in terms of, in terms of being a, a, a security. So they, as like a, a large set of, of cryptocurrency exchanges and, and the like are, Putting very clearly, we don't think this is a security, and I don't know of anyone else that reasonably believes Monero is a security either. So, you know, we were, when we talk about Monero compliance, we almost never have to talk about security stuff because we can just dismiss it because it's not relevant. It's it's great, and I think we we often forget how good that is. Um, um, is sure. there a difference in classification between a commodity and a currency uh, when it comes to your ability to legally list it? From my understanding, there's differences in the body that would regulate those. I'm not the expert on that by a long shot, but commodity would be regulated by one entity and a currency by another. I don't know how they differentiate the two. We're definitely not uh, a security, but I just realized that, I mean, I'm pretty sure everything has been going off of the work commodities aspect. And I just realized that a currency is a third category. Yeah, and typically for typically for a currency, it needs like in the United States and most states even they define currency or even money in cases to refer to government issued money. Makes so, um, I mean, e- each state has its own. I mean, it depends on what regulation you're even asking about. Remember, if you're talking about like money transmission, each state has a different definition of what type of asset fits that category. And if you're talking about just what is money (laughs) as a concept you know typically on the federal level they're referring to like government issued fiat so Mm -hmm. i think generally people in cryptocurrency tend to um put high importance on language precision and so there tends to be a, a lot of discussion around you know does this or that word apply to this or that cryptocurrency but i think when you get into questions of regulation uh those uh, definitional matters might, in the in the you know in a practical sense, matter a bit less than the question of which regulatory authorities think they have jurisdiction over uh, a project, because yeah. there there you know of course there are numerous of these um, bodies, and so each of them is going to have some opinion on that, and they're not really necessarily going to care about. You know, for example, the the common usage of a given word in a cryptocurrency community, and it's it's important to note too. I think that this whole um, Monero very obviously not being considered a security. It's that's that's nice to see because I think many in the community that are well versed in cryptocurrency and even a little bit in law will recognize that, and it's very obvious. But it's nice to see regulators and other folks. Um, making the same determination because it's an example of of common sense and logic prevailing, which I think oftentimes if someone makes a decision you don't agree with, you you tempted to say, or at least I'm guilty of thinking, oh, that person's crazy or or whatever, or they're just on a different thought process than me. But when you see this, it, it kind of helps to reinforce the idea that good and logic and reason does prevail in the end. Like you, you'd bet that if they're, or I would bet that if they could regulate it, they would, but there's nothing to regulate. You can't outlaw math or computer coding in one country. Someone else is going to do it in another country. And you can't tell people what they can do uh, yeah. on their spare time in the evening. It's You, you can't regulate. You can apply uh, choke points at the conversion to fiat, which I think is fine. And you should, to some extent, or there's arguments that that's beneficial for society, but you can't stop people from contributing code to a decentralized platform. In, in addition to that, there was an interesting legal argument that I read um, from, I forget if it was, a, it was a programmer turned lawyer or a lawyer turned programmer. And he was trying to explain to the other sides uh, what the concept of legal color was. And it, the idea that he gets across, um, I can link this in whatever comment section we have for this video. So if anybody wants to read this, I highly recommend it. Um, and his conclusion was, hey, freedom of speech has something referred to as color and uh, lawyers, uh, sorry, judges can ban uh, individual works 
or particular instances of text or regulate them without falling afoul of free speech. Uh, and we have examples of this in, uh, say, ITAR and uh, copyright, trademark. Um, all of these refer to particular instances of speech. And if you go and you start with something that has uh, already been regulated, um, the end product becomes tainted by by its association with that. Even if you just mutate it repeatedly and get to the end result, it still started from something that was banned. Um, whereas with cryptocurrencies, you start with a random number that's generated on your computer. That's your seed, and it, it generates your your uh, public address, which is also it 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 has not been tainted by being associated initially with something that was banned, which puts it into the uh, the realm of actual speech. This this is not something that has originated from something that's been copyrighted or or has been restricted. It's it actually a priori it it exists on its own as speech. And I, I thought that was an interesting argument. Yeah, but um, the... I'm sorry. I thought you were, go ahead. Yeah. No, carry on. I'm no, sorry. I mean, I think all that is, is great and true, but once it turns into value, that's where these issues come up, right? Where it turns out where you can trade it for goods and services. And now it has value. Yeah, now it can replace... Yeah, now you can, it, can, it can replace the U.S. dollar. You know, I can pay you with this thing now instead of U.S. dollars. And that's where then it goes beyond freedom of speech and, and enters a new realm of The regulation. amount of precedent that it would have to overturn, I think, is so significant that it becomes very difficult to do anything. I, I have a feeling that at least the United States government's hands are tied on the global stage. In terms, I, of I don't think they could do anything right now. Just be just because of the precedence of of free speech, like they've they've worked themselves into a corner with precedent. I agree. They'd have to overturn so much to go against this one thing, and it wouldn't probably benefit the bigger agenda. I mean, you you could you could say okay, they'll they'll overturn everything and they'll just say this is illegal and precedent means nothing. But something tells me that that's a bit bigger of a deal than. Then it seems, I guess it the, seems like a big deal to me. Yeah, I think the U.S. government reach comes into play anytime it touches the U.S. dollar. So you could have completely non-American parties, you know, two Russian guys in China, in not even different countries. But if they're dealing in U.S. dollars, if, there's, if they're doing any transaction in U.S. dollars, I believe the U.S. government has far enough reach to to interfere or whatever, take any action concerning that transaction. So I think the same would apply for cryptocurrencies. If uh, any time it touches the dollar, it doesn't matter where you are, who you are, the U.S. government can have a say in it. I believe. I would, again, I'm not, I'm not a criminal lawyer, but from what I've read and from my personal experience, that, uh, that can <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I, it does speak ahead, to the uh, to the um, possession versus transfer, right? So, kind of what need money is talking about is the constitutional basis for that, which would support the uh, ownership of cryptocurrency, setting aside the transfer of the value, just yeah. base ownership. And so, you know, that's going to be a requisite thing to be legal in order to even have a conversation about is the transfer then uh, legal. So, yeah, I think there, you know, it is, there are sort of like legal philosophical supports for this whole idea that uh, the basis of cryptocurrency is based in speech. Uh, and, and the degree to which that's true, it, who knows, it might be challenged in the future, there might be a uh, a need for people who really care about this to step up and, you know, put up a challenge, uh, if challenged on this point. But uh, just more broadly, I think the whole, you know, whenever I see talk about cryptocurrencies being banned, 
it tends to be kind of ham fisted. I mean, it's like, it's like crypto people tend to think of the government as being this, like this monolithic thing. And the reality is that there are numerous agencies, each with their own kind of uh, specific area of the law that they're charged with um, enforcing. And, you know, it's, it's just, a, you know, it's kind of like the analog of normies painting all cryptocurrencies with one broad brush and saying they're all this or they're all that. I mean, it, this is going in the opposite direction. It's like cryptocurrency guys painting governments in, a, in one fell swoop. You know, there's a lot of subtlety to this. There's the federal, state, local levels, and then there are the many different, you know, aspects of of the law that you know governments are charged with um, uh, enforcing. So, as far as, I mean, I think that's one thing that uh, leads to this phenomena in which we in behavioral finance. So, you know, the hedge fund that I used to work at was uh, we specialized in the application of behavioral finance to um, equity investing. And so behavioral finance is the idea that, you know, maybe markets are not completely rational all the time. Maybe there are human biases, human tendencies towards misperceiving things that uh, lead to displacements of free market prices from what is truly rational, right? And so this whole idea is one that is if you look at the um, you know academic finance community, it's sort of like a minority view within that. The majority view is that prices are always rational, prices are always correct, um, and and then you have the behavioral finance people saying, "Well, wait a minute, maybe you know maybe there are exceptions to this. Uh, maybe it was not rational for Pets.com to have gigantic valuations back in the dot-com bubble. Maybe it's not rational uh, that." cryptocurrency market cap rankings are the way they are today. And I think that that um, behavioral finance has a lot to offer, I'd say, in, in the state of the cryptocurrency industry at this point in time, where it's, you know, actually, in contrast to the dot-com bubble, it's much harder for people to get their heads around the way cryptocurrency actually works, you know, uh, compared to the internet, which is basically... You just have to understand that, you know, now the entire world has a Xerox machine that can copy packets uh, everywhere around the world. That's not too hard to understand. But in contrast, you know, if you really want to get your head around how Bitcoin works, it's hard enough that, you know, you might need a one hour video to uh, help explain it to you. Um, but oh, there were such things. <laughs> right. So uh, so going back to this um, idea of, you know, governments, quote unquote, banning cryptocurrency. So one of the uh, ideas in behavioral finance is that of uh, prospect theory. So prospect theory, I, I, this could be a, well, it, it might be a, something for me to expound on later, but I'll just quickly summarize what it is. Pro prospect theory is the um, Nobel Prize winning uh, observation that humans process positivity and negativity in different parts of their brain. So basically the reward uh, centers of the brain are different than the parts of the brain that process threats. So evolutionarily, the process of threats is given highest priority. You know, basically if you're running from a tiger that's chasing you and trying to eat you, you know, that's gonna take precedence over, um, you know, the reward that you get from, you know, collecting berries in a bush, right? So. Um, so the, the person who is rationally thinking about threats, uh, evolutionarily, they're probably the people who got eaten, right? So if they're, if you're kind of sitting there thinking, oh, it's, you know, what's the probability that that tiger there is actually going to eat me, uh, then, you know, those are the people who might've gotten you know, lost in the, in the past. So anyway, the, the idea here is that, um, humans tend to magnify the magnitude of negative outcomes and to the detriment of positive outcomes. So there are lots of experiments that have kind of proven this. So if you, uh, for example, if you offer a person the following um, uh, deal, so we're going to flip a coin. If it comes up heads, I'm going to give you a dollar. If it comes up tails, you're going to give me a dollar. So it's a 50-50 chance of either outcome happening. But people will tend not to do that because they look at the prospect of losing a dollar 
And that gets magnified, outsized importance in their mind as opposed to the positive. And so there's actually a, like a nonlinear plot of actual goodness to what your brain perceives as being the goodness and actual badness versus what your brain perceives as being badness. That's prospect theory. And so, you know, whenever there's this kind of um, unnuanced talk of uh, the ban hammer coming down on crypto, and especially, of course, it, that kind of talk happens on Monero the most, it reminds me of, of prospect theory. Um, basically, the it's easy for people to make a, um, a scary monster out of, of something and give it outsized importance, which is actually not rational. If I could just make a quick note on the ban hammer. So in relation to Monero, um, it's worth noting that with Kraken getting their recent banking license or, or charter, I forget exactly which of the two it is in Wyoming, you can bet that all their current cryptocurrency offerings were heavily scrutinized prior to getting that charter. So I don't know, in my books, that t presents as a, a, a positive, or at least not a negative. Honestly, I think it's a positive for Monero specifically because this is now... Um, probably not the first time, but another time when um, the offering has been presumably heavily scrutinized by regulators. So I think the chance of any sort of ban hammer is actually lessened from that event. Uh, if I can interrupt for one second, uh, welcome Arctic Mine to the chat. Yes. I don't, Thank you. I, 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 nobody I just, just said anything, and uh, I just I just wanted to say uh, hello and back to our regularly scheduled conversation. Oh, yeah. Hey, Eric, do you want to try uh, test your audio? Say hi to everyone. We cannot hear you. Nothing. Badly. This is the first time Arctic Mind's using OBS Ninja. Yeah, I'm not hearing him either. No audio. We can see you, though, and that's what's important. You showed up and you, you made your presence up. known. Got the Monero shirt on. Indeed. Nothing. So while he's working on it, you hit allow on your mic settings. Yeah, you need like a, a bunch I of your right. stuff. And you might a lot need of stuff a degree going in on. computer science in order to do this. <laughs> Guys, if I can figure it out, I don't know, or like mine, maybe try to, to, uh, to do the old plug in, plug out thing or restart the window. Have you turned it off and on again? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Welcome to tech support. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Yeah. Does Cake Wallet provide any sort of tech support for this issue? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised the kind of requests we get in the support chat. Like, we don't do that. Can you help me set up a node? You know, for example. <laughs> <laughs> I need a node set up. I need my mic to work immediately. Yeah. Just Gooey subscribe help, to Cake you. Wallet. Cake Wallet advanced support. Costs fifteen yeah. bucks a month. Yeah, yeah. Let, me, uh, let me let me bump it up to my supervisor. Yeah, you pay for the little extra for the app. You can text Vic at home on the weekend in the evening. And he'll, he'll help you. People do. People do anyway. Vic already provides that level of support for free, so it's not. Exactly. Why, why do I want to pay fifteen bucks for this? Still can't. Yeah, Arctic Mind, right. sadly, we can't hear you. So we're gonna we're gonna keep going on, but I hope that you're able to still join us. With, um, with all with these computer audio. side geniuses online, we can't. I know. The I know. Thing it, it is actually kind of funny because sometimes you'll watch like some talks or things for people that are perfect, like total professionals at C plus plus development. Maybe they're working on some completely complex like Tor or I two P type routing thing. And then, like, to do a presentation, they have a TV in the background that they are like cycling through. It's it's, it's kind of funny how it works sometimes. But uh, our, I mean, we're all we're all we're all pros. We're going to keep working on this. We're going to have the best quality here. I want to take a step back though um, and, and talk a little bit more about some of the major findings of the white paper. We got a little bit down uh, the, the philosophy side, which is of course fine. But I want to talk a little bit more on compliance and what this specifically means for exchanges, other services that want to support Monero real quick. So I'm going to you know, name some quotes from the paper. Feel free for anyone or anyone, feel free to jump in and, and get some thoughts on these if, uh, you know, if you want to add another comment. So there's about 10 or so quotes that I want to read out. So uh, One second, just... Mick, do you have the white paper right there printed out? <laughs> well, I thought that's what that was. Okay, carry on. Nice, nice stuff. See, I, I've, I have, haven't printed it out. I'm kind of out of paper. Anyway, 
Major quotes. Um, allowing VASPs to support privacy tokens. Oh boy, Daniel, Daniel has a color printer. He just <laughs> went out <and> <laughs> Yeah, I care about the environment, you know. Oh, you know. okay, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, which page are you on? on uh, oh, just I, didn't, I didn't page these. Oh, okay. Sorry. Right, go ahead. Sorry. You're about to control F if you're using a, a, a computer. Um, allowing VASPs, which refers to virtual asset service providers, uh, to support privacy tokens under current tested AML regulations strikes the appropriate policy balance between preserving money, sorry, preventing, preventing money laundering, not preserving it, uh, and allowing beneficial privacy preserving technology to develop. I believe that was in the conclusion deck. Um, other, uh, I'll just keep going through these. Some, if someone has a comment, just just jump in on these. Yeah, hashtag not money laundering. So the yeah. first comment, which I think will apply to everything you're about to say, is that this white paper, it it didn't and it shouldn't be anything groundbreaking. It's just a, it right. seems to counter the narrative that privacy is bad and oh my goodness, if you can't see, if we have this asset that's equivalent to cash and you you can't trace it um, publicly around the globe. Like, oh, that's a terrible thing. Like, no, this this is, in my opinion, just shifting things back to the center. This is um, the existing regulations probably are sufficient is what it's saying. Um, it, these privacy tokens, narrow included, can fit within that framework. It's just equivalent to cash. So all, all I wanted to say is that it is that anyone that wants to dedicate the time to reading the white paper, it's not going to be groundbreaking unless you're of the opinion that, you know, privacy is some bad thing or you shouldn't have these. Uh, type of private transactions. Yeah, I think the TLDR of the entire paper is that there is nothing fundamentally incompatible with privacy preserving cryptocurrencies with current frameworks of AML. Exactly. Good good way to put that. Yeah. I mean, just if, if I can add to that, I mean, just as enhanced AML techniques, I mean, it, these exchanges are already doing such deep high level you know your driver's license and your proof of residence and blah 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 selfie but with your dog think, you got to make sure dogs in the frame if you say you have one exactly yeah your arm your arms <laughs> put your shoe but, on your head and then take a picture <laughs> with your driver's license yeah exactly and but one of the things they added in there which maybe some of the exchanges aren't doing is uh proof of funds or at least a comment of where what these funds are for where they came from I think one exchange I use, Nexo.io, uh, they they actually ask that. They actually ask, where, where, what is this for? Is this from your salary or business or what are you going to use it for? And so some of them are already doing it. So like like uh, Talisman said, this is not really groundbreaking. I mean, if some of these exchanges just add those few more questions, they're, they're good to go. My opinion. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Another quote, not only do privacy coins provide public benefits that substantially outweigh their risks, existing AML regulations properly and sufficiently cover those risks, providing a proven framework for combating money laundering and related crimes. It's kind of what Pick was referring to. Um, businesses rely on and expect financial privacy. Without maintaining confidentiality, commercial transactions would be visible for competitors and nefarious actors to analyze, predict, front run, and exploit. Uh, privacy coins have enabled users to transact in a low cost, decentralized manner while maintaining the added benefit of financial privacy that was only, only previously available through financial intermediaries and institutions in the traditional financial system. I think it's funny that it goes back to like the traditional financial system in that, that quote. Can I, if I may, um, a comment on the last point that you made um, related to nefarious actors potentially being able to gain insight into your transactions. I think that the, an important example that I've quoted uh, in the community before is that if it can even be something as simple as your neighbor's kid mows your lawn and you give him some Bitcoin because um, you think, hey, he's a young kid. Maybe he's interested in this stuff. I'm going to get him into Bitcoin. I'm going to uh, pay him with Bitcoin. If he's heavy, he can go and find out that you have a lot more money in your wallet, Bitcoin wallet, that he would you'd like him to know about. So he's now done that, and he figures he'd like to have your Bitcoin. Uh, maybe he doesn't know enough about the, the blockchain yet or um, the whole concept to 
understand that he might not be able to gain access to it, but that might not stop him from breaking into your house to try. Um, so that could present a real problem for people uh, in a very innocent um, type of scenario, in my opinion. I, I heard an example where, you know, suppo <laughs> suppose you went on a date, right? First date and you, you pay the bill and you're like, oh, well, just pay me back in Bitcoin or whatever. You give the person your Bitcoin deposit address, which isn't actually your address. It's just the address of someone who has like $60 million in Bitcoin, say. And then you're like, oh, yeah, it's my address. Like that could be also used for nefarious purposes, for example, where you're trying to like use the public information to try and sway people. Like that, that, that's totally messed up. Oh, absolutely. Like, and if there's a like scenario, saying the Mt. Gox address is yours. <laughs> exactly. It's saying something like that. <laughs> and, and, and another example um, would be if a, someone in a political sphere is accepting campaign contributions, you can, a nefarious actor could blow through the contribution limit for that person and really put their candidacy in jeopardy by, um, it's a permissionless thing. You can donate $10,000 um, to somebody. And if the contribution limit is 2,800 bucks or whatever it happens to be, then that could present a real problem for them. And everyone can see this. It's public. Just for anyone out there who might actually have $60 million of Bitcoin, you should contact me <laughs> about getting your uh, crypto set up in an irrevocable trust because you shouldn't even think about dating before you've done that. <laughs> I want to skip ahead in some of these quotes. One of them, one thing Perkins Coie pointed to is they said, quote, if anything... Privacy coins pose lower inherent AML risk than other cryptocurrencies when considering evidence of illicit use in practice. They pointed to the Rand Corporation Commission paper um, that said that 80% of addresses that they found on darknet markets and the like are related to Bitcoin. And you know, a large portion are also related to Ethereum. Less than 1% are Monero, Zcash, and Dash combined. So in practice, at the moment, there isn't a significant <laughs> risk in dealing with these currencies because they are dealing with Monero. Sorry, they are dealing in Bitcoin. Um, I think that this was probably changing, honestly, especially in the case of ransomware. We've also heard that additional darknet market websites are supporting Monero exclusively at this point and, and more are switching over. So I think that this narrative is changing somewhat. Uh, but even so, the fact is most people use Bitcoin for their illicit activities. So people don't seem to have significant concerns about supporting Bitcoin when that's where you're most likely to bump into these type of activities. So it, it's, it's kind of surprising. And it's important to keep about these, you know, understanding about these things in context because it ultimately is a risk-based approach. You know, the risk is on Bitcoin, a lot of, you know, a lot of the nefarious activities related to Bitcoin and for other assets, it's really not the case as much in practice. So uh, it's more so people think so much about the theory as sometimes I think they lose sight of what's actually happening. So. Right. And, and also, Justin, on the dark net market topic, I've actually never been on a dark net market, dark net market but I, I would have to assume that there's a spectrum even there. There's probably things that most members of society would agree are very, very bad and that you shouldn't transact under any circumstance to obtain or do those things. But there's also probably people on there. You couldn't say there's not people on there buying their grandma's diabetes medicine from a cheaper jurisdiction in another part of the world, the market could be used for something like that too. So then you have the our 1% of privacy coins being used for uh, dark net market purposes. There's a spectrum there too of what, I mean, it's not 1% is being used to purchase carfentanil and distribute it on the streets. It's that percent is probably much, much smaller. I mean, yeah, I'm not too big of a fan of the whole um, this this whole concept that let's figure out what percent of a given community is quote unquote bad and then use that for our prior. You know, I'm not really a big fan of that argument because again, um, the compliance with the law is an individual thing. So in any group of people, you're going to have people who are squeaky clean and people who are not squeaky clean and. And truly, like, you know, again, there's going to be, a, again, a spectrum, just like um, um, Tallest Man uh, said. So uh, any group of people is necessarily going to have a spectrum, a range of people within it. And um, I think it's 
maybe easy to to try and kind of uh, come up with a percentage for any given group of people and kind of slap it on there and say, well, that's your percentage of getting a bad person. But uh, again, it's it's individual. It um, there shouldn't be a group a guilt by association kind of tendency. Sadly, Arctic Mind, we still can't hear you. He feels like he wants to add something. He, he's ready he's <laughs> to go here. It, you should try using Chrome. Uh, OBS Ninja generally recommends that people use Chrome. I know that that's or maybe Chromium. I, I don't know what, what you can run, but uh, hopefully you can. I still really hope you can join us, Arctic Mind. Um, are there any other comments on the Perkins Coie white paper in general? I was able to present it in a, in a compliance work group so far. They sat through an hour presentation on it. So people are seeing it. We're trying to make sure it gets out there. And um, we're trying to make the most out of it because I think, like, uh, I believe it was uh, Dr. Kim and a tallest man that said people are kind of irrationally scared of privacy coins. And so this just helps give people a little bit of faith that, okay, things will be okay. You have AML procedures. You're already exceeding standards. So take a deep breath. Like you have people like Kraken that are supporting Monero. They now have a banking charter. They're compliant. You, you can relax. And and I hope that that helps the ecosystem, you know, calm down and, and evaluate the risks um, more than just saying, oh, we have a privacy thing. Let's freak out. How was your talk received, Justin, to that group that you delivered the presentation to? Are there any major takeaways or questions that were seem to be a recurring theme on that presentation? I would say that the biggest feedback I received um, is that people were not especially comforted by the idea that it's similar to cash, just because increasingly in many jurisdictions, cash is seen as a substantial AML risk. Like in, in many European countries, even in the United States, although there are methods for regulating cash uh, deposits, it is increasingly that these requirements are getting stricter and people are like people, these regulators probably wish cash never existed, <laughs> right? They, they wish everything was through a bank or some other uh, institution they could regulate. So that's when we talk about things like cryptocurrency P2P transfers, like some bad recommendations. I know a lot of people freak out of those at the moment and it, it really isn't time to freak out about those yet. But ultimately the main feedback I received was, although they were very pleased to read the white paper, uh, they had some additional concerns about comparisons to cash because in their opinion, it wasn't as uh, comforting as, as perhaps we may think. Want to get another shot, Arctic Mine? Yeah, do you hear me now? Yeah. It works, okay. So it was Simon. Like it didn't, I didn't recognize the microphone the first time around and sign it. Um, well, on this one, um, cash, of course, I'm of a generation where cash was the norm in the 60s and in the 70s. And yeah, I think that there will be a paradigm shift in the future as we move from centralized ledgers that are easy to regulate to decentralized ledgers. In many ways, we're going back to the way things were 50 years ago. And that's, I think, what's going to happen with Monero is that it's going to become, there's going to be a, a pushback. We're going to get back into a cash-like situation. But speaking about cash, like here in North Vancouver, there are a whole bunch of businesses that after COVID-19 stopped taking cash. And every single one of them has flipped back again. So the war in cash, which is very much a, the efforts of companies like Visa, for example, has been pushing this in a very big way, is not happening the way people think it's happening, especially in North America. Uh, and even in European jurisdictions, you're sure you limit cash to a thousand euros like they're proposing in Spain from 2,500. But that still doesn't, doesn't affect the bulk use of cash. People are using cash all the time. And uh, I don't think cash is going to go away anytime soon. So there you go. Yeah, at least in the United States, the there is uh, some resistance to the idea that cash should be done away with um, simply because it gets um, used in, for example, low-income communities 
Uh, so, you know, there's a, uh, disproportional in impact that the elimination of cash would have on the, on those communities. So it's, yeah, it's, even though I'm, you know, the central bankers would love for that to be the case, because if all of your, uh, you know, funds are in a centrally controlled database, then it's easy for them to impose, for example, negative interest rates or, um, you know, give everybody a haircut to chip into, uh, you know, whatever budgetary shortfall there is. Uh, but the idea that cash should be done away with is not, um, it's not one that's um, going to be uncontroversial, I'd say. And also, if you look at the component of M1, in the, at least in the U.S., if you look at the component of M1 that is in the form of uh, cash and currency, uh, currency and uh, and coins, that actually spiked up along with the rest of M1. So there's no, um, at least empiric evidence that uh, the issuance of physical cash or currency is is going anywhere anytime soon. Well, I would say about the discrimination element, that's a very, very good point, because one can make a very, very good case that eliminating cash is actually discriminatory. Um, and on a whole bunch of arguments, and that is essentially that it fundamentally impacts those that are most vulnerable, those who are poorest uh, in, in any community. So that is a, it's, it's an incredibly good point, uh, that there is definitely an argument that um, centralized ledgers that are proprietary discriminate, period. Interestingly, that's what Satoshi in the paper mentioned specifically, that if you have a centralized ledger, you cannot avoid discriminate. So, mm -hmm. so discrimination is definitely a, a very strong argument here. I think in any uh, non-fungible record of accounts, uh, this will be a growing problem, I think. It doesn't really get talked about as being a downside of a transparent uh, surveillance coin. But once you can attach kind of demographic data to different accounts, it becomes easy for anybody to discriminate in whatever way they, they you know, would like to. And so this is something that doesn't really get mentioned much, um, but I think it's uh, something that should be on people's radars uh, kind of the application of, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, federally protected discrimination, just any sort of discrimination, just any sort of ability to um, kind of paint a broad brush on some group of people and deny them services. It doesn't matter who the group is, which direction it's going or whatever. It's just um, kind of an unsettling concept. And it's something that is facilitated if you have a a uh, record of accounting that is not fungible. And I think people are, are or regulators are, um, they're not dummies. They're, they're smart people. And, and they know that you can't get 100% compliance on some of these efforts. So if you do away with fiat currency or cash, people are going to just trade other things. And then how do you tax that? They're going to move to cryptocurrencies, which... Um, you know, again, could be private or non-private, they're going to trade services. If I'm going to cut your hair as a barber, um, probably, uh, and then I receive a good from you, say you're going to change the oil in my car, how are you going to tax that transaction as a regulator? So I think that they're smart enough to know barter. that. Yeah, barter is definitely in the list of things that's covered uh, for how to tax. Like I, I looked into that a while back. Right. So I think they have to leave some cash on the table to prevent total non-compliance with these uh, specifically taxation regulations? I, I would argue that you do not need non-fungible assets for taxation. The best example of the 1930s is Al Capone, who was actually called for income tax evasion. The IRS needs to, need to look at its success there rather than worry about Monero, in my opinion. That's another story. If you look at taxation rates in most of the developed world in the 1950s and the 1960s, which were fundamentally cash economies, the top marginal brackets were close to 100% in many countries, some countries even over 100% in the high 90s. So to think that you need centralized ledgers to keep organizations like the IRS or the CRA or Inland Revenue or or Hacienda Española, whatever you, which one you want to pick, in business is, um, uh, I think, a fallacy. Uh, you can collect taxes, and it has been done for years with fungible assets, and it will continue to happen in the future. 
Yeah, I think in relation to the white paper, most people were concerned about money laundering risks rather than tax avoidance risk. I mean, I know that they're often related, but, uh, you know, when the FATF is sitting down and having these conversations and they're publishing their red flags, white papers and things, it's all about money laundering and terrorist financing. That's that's a major context of things at the moment, I would say. Um, ultimately, as we know, if the U.S. government needs more money, they'll just make more, right? <laughs> so... Um, Okay. Uh, any other major topics on this? I know there's a few of the things we want to cover during the call. Um, I know we didn't really get a chance to talk about, you know, cipher traces tracing thing. I think at the moment we'll leave that for the other video on the channel, but, you know, certainly other discussions that need to come into play with, you know, Monero tracing tools and OFAC sanctions and tons of other, we really have had a huge number of things happen in the last month. So this call is really overdue. Uh, so any, any other compliance comments before we move on to some other things? Nothing on my end. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think I want to give it over to Dr. Daniel Kim just because I want to give you time to talk about Monero Sound Money Safe Mode. During DEF CON, you gave a talk, you know, all three days uh, on this type of presentation, and you spent a lot of time putting it together in a, a really nice, presentable format for people. So I, I want you to have a chance to describe it to people, you know, explain it, and, and then... Uh, Talk about why you feel it's an important talk for people to to see. You're muted at this point to me. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay. So yeah, so for the last couple of years now, I've been um, kind of constantly working on this talk as to how how to best summarize this new technology to people who don't necessarily have had the time and the energy to sit down and understand how, for example, Bitcoin works. Uh, again, it's the um, issue of the of being in sort of a dot-com sort of bubble in cryptocurrency in which there's just a whole lot of misinformation, a whole lot of lack of understanding. And, um, it, you know, as someone who's been involved in education pretty much all my life, you know, as an undergrad, I tutored physics and math to fellow undergrads at Harvard. Um, at, as a grad student, I actually taught violin performance at Cornell for a while. Um, and then after that, I was a med school professor. So I helped uh, MDs who were studying for their board exams to get board certified in radiation oncology. And then in a business school context, I was, you know, like a 14 time teaching assistant for the executive MBA program at Yale, uh, teaching a variety of, you know, concepts. So um, I think just having a uh, uh, desire to kind of explain things to people is what was behind this is, is really a, a broad, not just a technical aspect, but also the, you know, social societal aspects uh, of how uh, Bitcoin and Monero work. Uh, so this is what that video is. And the, uh, the latest iteration of that is called sound money safe mode. And it's based on the talks, as Justin said, that I gave um, recently at DEF CON, which was held completely virtually this year because of the, uh, the pandemic. So yeah, I think it's something that anyone who wants to learn about Monero or Bitcoin should watch. And even if you feel that you're beyond that point, even if you think you, you know, really know everything, I would suggest watching it uh, with a like a mentality of you're checking out this video to see if it's good enough to share with other people who are asking you questions about how Bitcoin and Monero work. Uh, it's it's really an educational um, summary of the issues behind Bitcoin and Monero and uh, the similarities and differences that they have to each other, but also uh, against, uh, for example, gold and the fiat banking system. So. Yeah, I would encourage anyone to to check it out. That is on the Monero Community Workgroup channel. It already has you know, some thousands of people that have seen it, and I expect it to be one of the most viewed videos on the channel for quite a while. <laughs> um, other things I want to get across, too, um, is that uh, Sereng Nother, who has spent the last many years contributing to the Monero, CC, sorry, Monero Research Lab, um, he has decided that he does not want to renew his CCS proposal uh, again in the fall. So basically that means he will not be creating a new CCS proposal and asking for donations. So uh, we are going to be, you know, in effect, losing a, a, a full-time Monero Research Lab position. Uh, other people that are in the Monero Research Lab will be stepping up and doing work. And, and 
I, I, I assume Zoring will probably stick around for a bit. Yeah. Do you think Cypher Trace got him? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> After that interview, do you think they got him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, there, there are certainly That's many other loss. people that are contributing, but Zoring was really the, you know, it, for the past year or so, he was the, the contributor that was full time working on it. So, uh, you know, certainly sad to see him. Uh, Stepping back slightly, although I, I assume that it'll still be somewhat involved um, because it's hard to walk away from an arrow completely after, especially after being adverse so much. There's, there's, it's hard to say goodbye forever. Um, I don't see how you could just walk away and just not think about it anymore. <laughs> going that deep. Well, and is that what's happening, or is no, he just no. doesn't he, want to be paid anymore? And he's, he's not. He doesn't want to want to continue getting paid. He's he's expressed some apprehension in the past about putting up his proposals because uh, he he he's thought it was a strain on the community at points. But I mean, I've told him absolutely not. You're one of this is one of the biggest bang for the buck that we're getting out of the CCS. Um, but hopefully this this is just him saying, you know, I'll, I'm going to step back, take a break for a bit and contribute when I actually can in my free time. He's been having a lot of burnout. So uh, sort of in a business school concept uh, context, the issue of compensation within organizations is something that's sort of like a branch of human resources. And uh, about this, I'll just say that one unfortunate drawback to the way uh, compensation structures are usually uh, formulated is that when you do have people who are on an extreme end of the bell curve in terms of capability, they tend to not get a correspondingly outsized compensation package. Compensation tends to be uh, coupled more to the job description than to the actual talent of the person uh, who's doing it. Um, and that's kind of unfortunate in uh, all organizations. I suppose it's fortunate for those organizations who have the ability to discern, uh, you know, multiple plus sigma level talent and, uh, and treat it accordingly. But often that just doesn't happen. And then one thing I want to bring up, I think this might be the last point unless we have just because we've gone on for a while, we might have to schedule another one of these for next week instead of waiting another, another month just because we've only gone through like half our topics. But uh, a few weeks ago, I made a Reddit post, which some people might argue is controversial. I, I made it, Monero is easily the most prestigious coin. And this is based off some discussions that Doug and I have had back and forth uh, where you know people will be posting on the cryptocurrency subreddit, say, and we'll be talking about different coins and someone will mention Monero and... It's highly uploaded. A lot of people have very positive comments about it. And the original post might not even have anything to do with Monero. But this person brought up Monero and people are like, yeah, you're right. And then someone brings up Coin X. And everyone's like, oh, you're such a shill. Why would you bring up another coin? What are you doing? What are you, you know? And so you have, in my view, you have a, a large number of people in the Bitcoin community that are like very pro-Bitcoin. And then you have other people that are, that are like, no, Bitcoin sucks, right? Yeah, there's and an theory that you have. And if they would same with Ethereum, right? You have Ethereum where people are like, "Oh, Ethereum's great," and then on the, you know you have all the Bitcoin maximalists are like, "No, Ethereum's a scam. It's horrible." You know, "Oh, why would you do this?" With Monero, you have people that are like, "Eh, it'll be bad," right? <laughs> but like, they're very, very small, very small number of people are like actually actively against Monero and have very convincing arguments. Like most of them are just it, most people respect that Monero seeks out to do what it says it does and doesn't really have a scammy nature about it. And I just wanted to make a post about it. So sure, it was a bit of a shill thing for me to go and post something like that. But it's been my observation in the wider cryptocurrency communities is that you bring up Monero and you're like the cool guy, right? You, you, you don't mess with the dude that's showing up to the Bitcoin meetup with the Monero shirt, right? Yeah. You know that no. they are... I think, you know I think they, I think it's true what you're saying, Justin. Um, I think Monero has built up a reputation of uh, serious mathematicians, scientists, programmers, coders, whatever, philosophers even, uh, involved in the community and are not in it just 
for a pump and dump type of scheme. Um, number go up. Yeah, and I, number go up. Yeah, and um, you know, even back in 2017, when I started getting involved in this community, you know, I saw there's no talk of Lambos, there's no talk of Moon. <laughs> it was, and the skepticism that comes with from within the own community. I mean, even your own show that you had, uh, Justin, breaking breaking Monero. We we want to break Monero. We want yeah. we want criticism. We want people to attack it and tell us what's wrong. I think all those things combined, I, there's definitely a respect, especially in the Bitcoin. I hate using the word maximalist, but even in the Bitcoin maximalist space community, there's some respect for Monero. Uh, earlier this year, I went to the Satoshi Roundtable in Mexico, uh, thanks to Fluffy Pony for the invite. Um, and everybody there was a Bitcoin person. But uh, you know, as soon as I introduced myself and said what we're doing with Cake Wallet from Monero, it was like, okay, I'm an Arab. Okay, you're a, you're a serious person. You know? <laughs> we'll, we'll let you in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, you're a serious person. You're not here just, you know, uh, trying to run some scam and all that. So de- definitely. We are I mean, there I, to I, shill I, a little bit. But sorry? We are there to shill a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you know, the cake, I mean, through the Cake Wallet Twitter account, we do do some shilling. And some Monero community members have, you know, um, spoken out publicly or privately that you know we shouldn't be talking of price and all that but I think I mean, why not i think we need more of that personally uh and th- those i i think that that's a culture that has uh kind of happened just because the the main subreddit we decided we didn't want price posts in there and yeah. we fairly strictly enforced that and it's kind of bubbled out but i I think that some amount of price discussion is probably a good thing and people being exuberant. Like, I don't, I don't want to quash that completely. Like people, it's fun. Well, I have a bit of a different take on that. And that is that price discussion may actually be necessary when dealing with things like spam control um, and different types of scaling options. Um, so that comes into that picture in that area in a very critical way. I mean, people, I think in the community, I mean, give an example. I mean, there was a discussion of what happens if we have a, a hundred times the transaction activity that we have in Monero right now, and then it drops down. And then one of the questions that you come up with is, okay, fine. What are the, what are the spam risks? And then once you make, get to that question, then you get to the next question is, well, how does price come into that? I mean, what would happen if you have a hundred times the, the, let's say, three, the transaction level of say, uh, a four, the current the current three hundred um, uh, kilobyte limit? Sorry, three hundred by three hundred thousand byte limit. And so, what would the price look like? And then, what would the cost of spam look like? And so, the technical issues that come in with price, which is just more than chilling. I mean, what I'm getting at is that we cannot ignore what the impact of adoption on price is going to be if you're planning scaling and if you're planning um, how do you deal with spam, for example, on the network. So that's a sort of a side to that, but that's just a sort of a point that I, that I kind of noticed. The other thing that happened to me, and that was at a Bitcoin conference in Canada, um, I was introduced literally by uh, exchange members of exchanges or staff and exchanges to their compliance people as a way of putting them into the deep end, literally. Let you just say that. That was interesting. Well, we'll go I don't understand the, that. What do, you, what do you mean by that? They, they introduced the compliance officer of an exchange to me I see. And, as a way of throwing that person into the deep end. <laughs> that seems kind of silly, like... I know it sounded silly, but that was the perception of Monero as the that we talked about the non-compliant coin or whatever you want to say, or a dark coin or privacy coin. Or... Right, right. Well, hopefully you changed their uh, mind just by. Yes, speaking. I did. <laughs> it was kind of really interesting. The guy said, "You're throwing me into the deep end." Well, and on that that topic too of price discussion, that's a very good point. That from some uh, perspective, I don't think Doug that. This, I mean, you, you do you moderate this type of discussion when it's related to technical? Um, no, no, we don't. Price considerations. No, 
Um, and in fact, we don't have any filters uh, at the moment for trading discussion. Um, that that might change actually in the near future. We all now, that just realized, <laughs> now, now that I just realized that we don't have anything for things like the words exchange or trade. It, well, I'm not airdrop. <laughs> but um, yeah, right. <laughs> At the moment, um, there's no filters for things involving uh, price discussion, and we do it on a case-by-case basis. But even if something technical did come up and we had filters, we would probably approve it because, like, things involving fee rates aren't the kind of price discussion that we're looking to suppress. It's, It's not about inherently the price going up. The discussion is more about the protocol. And it has a different motivation. Well, I think, too, that um, kind of going on what you said earlier, I'm actually okay with a little bit of Lambo talk. When I was first getting into Bitcoin, that was a very exciting element to see on our Bitcoin was like, oh, my goodness. Like okay, the, the rules a Lamborghini. explicitly say no memes or image macros. However, the, the unspoken rule, uh, that's actually followed behind the scenes is no more than two memes on the front. We'll remove the one that was made the earliest. Well, and that's what I was going to say is that, that I don't, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with a meme or two, but the problem is when they displace all the actual yes. valid discussion on the front page that, and you see that on some of the other subs is like, it's all memes. There's rocket ships. There's that's why that rule exists. <laughs> We, yeah, so like want to go the way of r slash Bitcoin. We we tried to look at some of the pitfalls that they had experienced and modeled ourselves after that. Well, I think that just goes to speak to like it's hard, if going back to the whole point of the most prestigious coin two thing. Like the Monero subreddit is one of the only subreddits that you can go to and actually have discussions these days about cryptocurrencies. Right? I know I say that as a mod of the cryptocurrency subreddit, but honestly, I hate using that subreddit often because it's just. It's still mostly price related, right? If I want to have a discussion with people that are going to go in depth about some technical thing or are going to have a, a, an honest conversation about what the actual privacy limitations are of a system rather than, oh, well, let's just hope this thing will find a way for someone to do an application or second layer or who, let's hand wave this future solution away. Like, we actually have those discussions and it's really awesome. And, you know, Doug, credits to you and the rest of the moderation team for continuously making it happen, you know, making rules such a the discussion is focused that way right like without that it would be much worse and we still have subreddits for people to post memes and things right but mm-hmm. it, it just means that we can have it se- separated and it's, it's a it's a really great subreddit as a result as a result of your moderation efforts you guys on the the main monero sub i've seen people come from other communities just to ask even a non-monero related question because they know they're going to get level headed <laughs> irrational and, and technical and they're going to be able to answer it yeah i've seen that too so isn't that funny yeah we always do answer those by the way and i mean cake wallet we just say hey use cake wallet <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of high level responses, Cake Wallet, so, you know, account says just use Cake Wallet and spam it in every single post. Um, I'd good. like to note that we're pushing an hour and a half on our hour long. Yeah, we are about to wrap up here, but it was it was been a ton of fun. Um, we only covered half the things I really wanted to talk about, but that's okay. We'll probably have another conversation sooner than a month from now, just because mm. if the news cycle stays this way, we're going to have to have calls every other day, not every month. <laughs> it's just been so much going on. So uh, yeah, really, really awesome that all six of you were able to join, I guess, including me, all five of you and six, including me. Artic, mm-hmm. thanks so much for you know, stopping no by problem. too. Glad you're able to get your mic worked out. And, uh, you know, we have a really good quality set now, so hopefully we'll be able to have high-quality recordings like this in the future. But, um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining. See you in the next Monero meet. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.